So it was actually uh, just about a year ago, I went to the Lean UX on conference that, uh, that uh, Michael and Trevor Owens had put together, a meetup not unlike this, and ended up just in a session about design sprints, and we were talking about how to solve some of the problems. I was talking some about the design sprints I'd done, and uh, a guy named C. Todd Lombardo became one of my co-authors. We went out for drinks afterwards, and said, so how do you feel about co-authoring a book? And so you never know what's going to happen at a meetup like this. So uh, you could end up writing books too. Uh, this is the book we just uh, put out uh, with O'Reilly. It was a lot of fun to write. It took a long time to write. It's really a, a reference, uh, Jonathan, as you were saying, of just uh, not just the why, but you know, a pretty detailed script of the how you can run a design sprint. And I'll be talking about design sprints tonight. So uh, the problem that we want to solve is, like, how do you know that the product you want to make is the right product? You can come up with some ideas and uh, you know, might come down from marketing, hey, celery jello. Uh, or even, uh, remember airtime? It seemed like a really good idea at the time. They spent a lot of money and people loved chat roulette, but uh, airtime did not happen. It was dreamed up, it was made, and it flopped. So, uh, really, um, making things that people want is much better than trying to market them and make people want things. So, uh, so what is a design sprint? Uh, first, I'll give you some, some background uh, on it. The architecture industry had had things called design charrettes for a long time as they are preparing to make a building and we just built out a space ourselves and went through a design charrette process with our architecture firm where you get everyone in the room and do a lot of sketches and share your ideas and prepare for your, what you might want to make. And uh, these ideas had percolated up through the gaming industry uh, that were following very similar processes. And then uh, there were a bunch of design exercises, exercises that people like us do all the time. And uh, the book and website GameStorming documented a lot of those. And then uh, enter Google Ventures and Jake Knapp. And uh, the way I've heard it told is that he uh, needed to go out as their designer, or design team entrepreneur in residence and uh, meet with their companies and he wanted to come home after a week to spend time with his family. So meanwhile, some of these companies, maybe they needed a change in direction or some help on the design side. And they thought, hey, what can we do in a week? And found that in a week, the time constraint actually enabled you to do great things and, and really focus with, uh, with design. So we wrote a bunch of blog posts, evangelized it. We realized, hey, these are the types of things that we've been doing, but in a structure we really like. We fell in love with it, blogged about it, started doing it to start our new projects. And uh, then we've done you know, a whole lot of them now. So uh, we at ThoughtBot also have open sourced uh, our design sprint repository. That is Flux, uh, making weird colors. Let me see if I can, if it keeps doing that, I might quit out of it. Um, but our design sprint uh, repository is also, uh, it's a little bit more lightweight than the book, but among other things, there is a Trello board that we use uh, during design sprints to document how they're going, collect all our materials every step of the way. And so we have a sample Trello board you can copy and use, and all this is open source. So uh, feel free to check that out. So uh, that is where to find it. And um, so a design sprint has lived by many names, in addition to the design charrette I mentioned. Uh, it's often called a design spike, product discovery, Discovery session, a deep dive is one that I like a lot, though that tends to imply a bit of a longer period. And uh, a discovery sprint, it's just really, it's the, the first sprint of a project should be just getting everyone to know each other and getting on the same page and figuring out what direction you might want to start in with a process that's well understood and, and proven. So, but a, a design sprint is a five phase, typically five day uh, process where you spend a day getting the, the background uh, on your users and what you're trying to do and everything that's came before. Uh, you want to diverge in the range of things as possible with a lot of sketching, converge to pick the right decisions, prototype in a day and validate it with users. So uh, what this has been called a bunch of places, so the similar phases from the Stanford Design School, uh, IDEO did a similar thing, uh, and uh, Google Ventures, as I mentioned, 
Uh, the inner loft at Constant Contact adopted this practice. That's where my author, C. Todd Lombardo, would work, and he would do this for a lot of the startups that were incubated there. Uh, we've done it at ThoughtBot, as I'd mentioned. So in this uh, first phase, you want to um, get the background, you're getting inspired, there's a problem you're defining, you're getting to know your user, and at the end of the day, uh, we would end every day with a daily retrospective. So, and I talked a little bit about some of what the phases are, and I'll go into details on some of these things and how we spend our time in these different phases. So it's important when doing a design sprint to really think through like what a design sprint can help you do and what it cannot do. Uh, what it can do is, as I mentioned, the, the time box really gives you a great focus and enables you to align a diverse team of not just designers and developers, product people, product owners, uh, might be the CEO or you know, the person who's the sponsor for the project that you're doing. And it's a well-defined process that can help you start in a clear direction. But there are times when this uh, process doesn't help. I love it, I like to do it a lot at the start of a project. There's sometimes when it doesn't work quite so well, such as if the product is already well-defined, there isn't a need to really diverge to redefine it. That's not a good use of time. Uh, we do uh, a day or two or sometimes more of research as part of a design sprint, but if you really know nothing about your users, your market, or what you're trying to do, and significant research is needed, you're going to need to do that first. And you know, often in our projects, if no research has been done, we'll spend a day or two meeting with prospective users and really getting that background to present to everyone on the sprint. Uh, but sometimes you really need weeks of research, and a design sprint can't do that for you. Also, if the business opportunity isn't clear, like you have an idea, oops, this just died. Uh, I don't mind, oh, here it goes. Uh, when you uh, don't know that this is a thing that can exist in the world, and maybe it's not, its goal isn't to, to make money, just to be used by a lot of people, but if, the, uh, if there isn't a business case for what you're doing, the design sprint isn't really where that's validated. You know this is a, the type of thing already that you wanna do. And if the scope is really broad, uh, that's uh, something where you might want to separate it out into multiple design sprints. And I've been in many sprints where you would start it and realize, actually, this is three products for five different users, and we need to break this up in order for it to be useful. Also, if you won't break up with your idea, if you come into the design sprint and the CEO knows exactly what she wants and there's no changing her mind about it, and meanwhile, everyone's there to get on the same page, but that page is already dictated, then a design sprint isn't a really good use of time. But it helps in a lot of other circumstances. So uh, as you're getting ready for a design sprint, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Usually, you know the project's about to start, and uh, you can prepare for it a bit. And it's important to make sure that you're going in with all the research that you've done already available so people can review it ahead of time and you can go over it together. Uh, there often you're going to be referring to other things that already exist in the industry. Maybe there's an existing product, an existing prototype. Uh, there are other websites that do something completely different, or apps that do something completely different, but solve a similar problem in a similar way that you want to consider and it's useful to collect all of those. When preparing, you don't want to already come in with an exhausted list, list of user stories or prioritized features. Um, those can be uh, determined together, but any background that's gonna be useful for everyone, you wanna prepare ahead of time. And you wanna make sure that you get the right people in the room. The, the same effect that causes you to not want to break up with your idea, sometimes it's called the Ikea effect, because you're really attached to that thing that you put together and you made, even if it's not the best thing. And uh, it's actually a real benefit at the end of the sprint, because the team will come together and rally around the thing that you decided to do together as you evolve a product going forward. But uh, you want to make sure that the people involved who are going to be the decision makers are going to trust the results and the research that comes out of the design sprint. And so you want to get them there if you can. If you can't get them there for the entire day, have them there when the decisions are made or the final research is presented so that they can feel part of the process and like they're buying in. The other thing to determine uh, before a sprint is, you know, what's the schedule? 
Uh, typically, these sprints we like to talk about them as five days, and if you're going to go through all the exercises according to the script that's in the book or Google Ventures blog posts, that will take five days, sometimes more. We've seen some sprints take two weeks. But there's a lot of flexibility, and the process itself is very flexible. It's intended to meet the needs of the room and the situation, and with the design exercises we have in our arsenal, we might swap one out for another, we might skip some, we might add others. And uh, the process can be flexible, and, some, and it's uh, still a useful thing to do, but sometimes you find yourself in a situation, once and I talk about this in the book, we find ourselves in a situation where uh, a client came to us with a massive opportunity. He was getting, leaving for the airport in three hours. So we had three hours to pick the most important exercises. And you know, we did. We did the best we, we could and actually got the team on the same page so that they could get started in that time. We weren't able to do research in that time. That had to come later. But we were able to do some diverging, some converging to figure out really what the user's journey was, what the biggest problems were, and to turn that into an initial wireframe we can move forward with. So it really can range. Uh, sometimes we've seen with our enterprise clients that uh, typically, it's the first three days that you want to get everyone together because then uh, the prototype might be done by the designer and then the research that then gets presented back to people. So the fourth or fifth day, sometimes the business owners are unable to attend. It's great if you can, but you can skip them. Uh, and sometimes even three days is too much to get all the right important people in the room. And when that happens, uh, we've actually shrunk the first three phases of understand, diverge, and converge into two days. And so we've done probably about 10 of these for uh, Merck and they started doing some of their own and they just found that they could always get people for two days and never for three. So that's uh, just something to think about as you're planning your sprints. Uh, also, you want to make sure that your logistics are taken care of. It's a really intense thing. So uh, in some of our other offices in San Francisco, the weather's always beautiful and you can walk around without running into a ton of people in Times Square. So they go out for lunch every day. But for us, we bring lunch in because getting lunch in a Times Square at 12.30 can be a bit of a zoo. And so we just want to make sure that we've prepared all those logistics, that we have a room, that we have the right supplies. We've got a couple kits so that we can do a couple sprints. And it includes like all the pens and dots for dot voting. And uh, especially our favorite, you see this a lot, post-its. So uh, for the under understand phase, uh, these are the phases listed in the book. I'll be going over some of those. Uh, but uh, it really has these sets of, of purposes, that you want to define the problem and know the user and gear up to do both of those things. So when you start a design sprint, it's really important to establish the ground rules. You want to understand that um, one of the most important rules, and you can decide these together, and there are many, you shouldn't have too many, but one of them is that you want to be easy on people and tough on ideas. When you're diverging, you're brainstorming a bit, and all ideas are good, but when you're converging and deciding, and you're doing, say, for example, a ritual descent exercise, you need to be really frank about why something wouldn't work, while still being really kind and respectful, letting people finish their sentences, letting everybody speak. Uh, another rule that can be really important is to uh, keep just one device on in the room, maybe one computer to project on the wall for uh, an agenda or to see some background. And otherwise, like when everyone turns their devices off and unplugs and really listens and attends to each other, the effect, especially now, can be magical. So you know, we might stack our phones, put our computers away. We'll have particular breaks that are structured where people know they can get a hold of us and we can get caught up with our email or our messages. But uh, those things are, are really uh, important to establish as you get started. Uh, another thing that we do right at the start of the design sprint is establish the idea of parking lot. And typically, that's just a giant post-it where some of the other post-its can come and live. But this is the notion that there are going to be a lot of ideas and a lot of great ideas. And there might be some that don't match the scope of what you're doing, don't match the challenge statement that you've agreed on, that you still agree on. There are great ideas and things to consider, maybe for another sprint or another time, but to make sure that those ideas feel heard and validated, and then you move them to the idea parking lot to really stay focused on what you need to do. So another uh, exercise that's really important um, that we like to do when we get started is a facts, assumptions, and questions exercise. So the idea here is there are things that you know that are facts. There are things that you don't know that are assumptions, and uh, there, are things, are there are things that 
you know, you know you don't know, um, and then things where you're not sure. So um, with each of these, like for an assumption, for example, we might assume like, hey, what's the least number of lines that you can do this with? And everyone remembers the Schmancy, the Schmancy solution where, hey, you can do it in four lines if you solve it and figure it out. Well, can you do it in one line? Well, sure, yeah, if you had a big enough pen or if you stack things up and folded the paper to do that. Like, there are a lot of things that, you know, you, that uh, you have to consider as you're assuming things and, you know, what some of the questions are. So, uh, this is just uh, something where each person on the team uh, would, you know, write some of these things down and assemble them on the board and talk about them. Uh, then for the assumptions themselves, it's useful to, you know, talk about them in terms of confidence and importance so that they can be prioritized as you're determining what you want to validate. So as you think about what you're really solving for, uh, a reframing exercise can be really useful. So, uh, you know, too broad might be, you know, uh, for any of the assumptions you would say, you know, how might we do such a thing? Uh, how might we re redesign dessert? That's too broad, but too narrow is, how might we design a cone for ice cream that won't drip? And often you end up starting someplace that's too narrow. And you can think about, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve with, how might we redesign ice cream to be more portable? Uh, another thing that's really important to do the first day of a design sprint is to speak with some users for empathy. Uh, some people will have talked to many users and done that research, but as you're designing, it's, it's useful to keep some people in mind, people that might be the ideal users of what you're creating, and to get a couple of them on the line and talk to them, listen to their concerns, to understand their background and keep them in your head as you're proceeding through the rest of the design sprint. So uh, another type of exercise that's useful is to do a uh, goals and anti-goals exercise. So just from the onslaught to understand what it is that you're trying to do and not trying to do. You're not trying to, you're, a lot of that will come later as far as you know what you come up with in the sprint. But understanding your goals and getting on the same page that that is useful. And understanding what you're not trying to do with your anti-goals is also useful. Uh, another exercise that we've done that's similar to that, that we've swapped in is a needs, wants, and desires exercise just to get a sense of initial prioritization, though then uh, you can deconstruct that later in the sprint. Uh, and another uh, exercise we usually end the first day with uh, creating an experience map of what is a user doing now to solve their particular problem? Uh, and where is it painful? Where are there dangers or opportunities where people are experiencing their most pain? And so we'll, we'll talk about a current journey. Uh, sometimes that'll take up a whole wall of a room as we talk about what people are doing today and then uh, put a whole bunch of post-its for the, uh, the opportunities. Uh, sometimes you're doing something that's so new that you've never done it before uh, and these journeys might look a bit more like a, a map of, a squiggly version of a map of subway stations that you know, you're going down this particular path as you're solving your problem and as you're breaking up and diverging later then you can focus on particular parts of the journey. So uh, after you've done that on the, uh, on the first day, um, something uh, it's really important to do at the end of the day is to have a retrospective, to talk about during the day what went well, uh, what you know, maybe went fine but could be improved, or maybe it didn't go well, and to come up with a plan of action for, for each of those. So uh, there are all kinds of different formats. I've seen sometimes a plus delta format. Uh, there's you know, a happy face, met face, sad face format you can use. You can go around the room. People can popcorn things in. One that's been really, uh, really useful in a situation where, for example, you might have a lot of introverts is if you uh, give everyone some post-its to talk about the things that they're happy about and not so happy about and people will write things that they might not be comfortable saying to the whole room and you can sort those and figure out what's important and for each of those come up with an action item like for uh, in a recent sprint we did for example uh, one of the actions is that you know there are a lot of people in the room and a lot of people that needed to be there that talked a lot and some people who were really important including the designer and the subject matter expert weren't getting a word in edgewise and for that design sprint, our action was we created a talking stick 
Uh, it was a water bottle. We you know put some like colorful cloth or something in it, and we passed it around. When you had that, you were talking, and if not, you waited for that person to finish. That's the only time we've needed to do that in all the sprints I've done. But for that, it worked really well, and it was a useful action item that we did to, to make something better. Uh, other things that you might find is, hey, we didn't take enough breaks. We'll take more breaks. Didn't have enough water, things like that. So that you can make sure that for the second day, if there are concerns, someone didn't feel heard, something happened, uh, you can address that. So uh, for the second day, that's a day where uh, you do a lot of sketching. Uh, previously to doing, previous to doing design sprints, I would uh, do inceptions. And at an inception, uh, we would write out a lot of story cards. There was just a ton of text. And we found that by drawing things, instead of uh, writing them down, it just really opened the creative floodgates. And it made us realize, hey, this iPhone screen is really small. We can't have all these things on it that we might write down and to see what, what things might look like. So uh, often we'll start with uh, writing some job stories of jobs to be done. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen uh, this before and there's whole talks around that, but uh, just to understand that if the user's in the situation, they have a need and they desire an outcome and identifying some of those can be useful. So then uh, we'll fold a paper up and maybe in six, maybe in eight and show uh, and create a bunch of different ideas. So, uh, you know, this is an example of some where, you know, we've, we've drawn some things. We'll then go around and present these ideas to everyone else in the room very briefly, each of us, and do another round of these so we can riff off of each other's ideas and just to generate as many ideas as possible in a design studio sort of methodology. So after we've uh, done that and have some good ideas, we've uh, created storyboards. So on a post-it, we'll draw a sketch of three different vignettes. Uh, often they flow next to each other. And these are things that won't be presented verbally to the team. They actually need to be written down in a concise way so that the vignette explains what's happening. And then we'll put that on the wall and we'll put dot stickers on afterwards to let some of the best ideas bubble to the top, kind of like a heat map. So uh, the, next, uh, the, the next day is where, uh, so for the, the Diverge day, um, it's really just repeating those ideas uh, and that process so that you do you know, some mind mapping to get the ideas out, some crazy eights to do them all really quickly to you know, get the ideas out and share them with each other and rounds of storyboards, maybe for different sections, for example, of the user journey map that you've created. So you might do a session just for, if you have multiple users, say first for the students and then for the teachers. Or you um, might say, well, the students and the mentors are having a very similar path. And so we're going to do the first part of the path and then the second. And at the end of the day, the walls will just be covered with uh, all the storyboards and everything that you've created. So uh, at the, uh, the Converge day, then uh, the first thing that you typically want to do is just to kind of recap everything that you've done, so uh, you have a sense of you know where things uh, where things have been, and refresh yourself after uh, having perhaps gone out with your team the night before to discuss everything that you came up with, and that's where you can do a lot more of dot voting and overlapping, and with the storyboards you can pull those post-its off and assemble them together into larger storyboards and wireframes create matrices and just really get a sense of you know, what are the, the conflicts between what you're doing and what might some resolutions be. And uh, one thing that you can do is also to create a uh, assumptions table. And here you can revisit some of the assumptions that you made on, the, on day one, uh, document what some of the, uh, your other assumptions are, and you can actually do another uh, prioritization exercise called the $100 test. We just did this in, Me in Mexico with the, as the 100 peso test. Uh, and uh, each person gets 100 pesos, for example, to uh, put on the assumptions that they feel are most important. And if there's someone who is, for example, uh, a major stakeholder, maybe they'd get a few more to uh, communicate that, but not a ton more. They're not making all the decisions. And that will get a sense of the priorities of which things might be the most important to test. How would we test them and, and validate them? as we uh, prepare to build a prototype and interview some users. 
So then uh, we would put together wireframes as a team. We'd break up into groups. Um, Design Sprint might have just four people in a couple of groups, or it might have a dozen people, and then maybe there'd be multiple groups. But for each group, we'll uh, take what we did in the storyboard and take the user journey and really identify how we think we might want to create a solution by, as a team, you know, doing some individual sketches, then coming together to take those sketches and put them together into a team wire or teams uh, wireframe. And then uh, for each wireframe, we would do a ritual descent exercise. And this is uh, so Will Evans has documented this a lot. It's uh, pretty awesome. It's kind of scary. But what you do is you uh, take your wireframes, you present them to the uh, other team in just a minute, and the team that made them will turn their back, while the other team, being uh, tough on ideas but gentle on people, will poke as many holes in it as they can and talk about everything that's wrong with it and why it won't work. And then you can say by the, the, the things that won't work, which things will and then go through and do another round of the uh, team wireframes and ritual descents for the other aspects of the application, uh, perhaps riffing off of what you saw in the first one. So then uh, finally, at the end of the Converge day, you'll put together a uh, group wireframe. Typically, the uh, designer present, uh, one of the designers present will be the scribe so that they can document how everything works. But then this is uh, what you're going to prototype. This is showing the functionality that you'd want to test. And uh, at the end of the day, you may find that there's some things that are tough to agree on. And it may be at that point that the person who is the CEO or the project sponsor might have to make some of those decisions. But generally, uh, things can converge quite well. And you come out of this with uh, uh, a map for what you might want to prototype and what you might want to test. So at the end of, a, of three days or even two days, you have you know, you're the first version, the first part of the, your product that you might want to prototype out and build. And so that's what you do on the, on the build day. Uh, so there are different, um, here you want to make things. You can test and, and learn them and create a prototype. Uh, there are different tools that you can use, like for some web things, we've actually used HTML and CSS to do it. Uh, typically we've used Envision for, for most of these. And uh, you know, I have a few I can uh, you know, show some people afterwards, so some of what these prototypes have looked like. Uh, some of the prototypes, depending on what you're trying to test and learn, they might be really low fidelity. They might just be some hand sketches. Or sometimes they might be high fidelity because, uh, say, it's a, a fashion site. And in order to you know, validate someone interacting with it, they want to have that feeling of, of being very you know, sleek and fashionable. And it can be anywhere in between, depending on what you're trying to learn, what you're trying to do. Uh, sometimes an ancillary goal of a design sprint is to take the prototype, you know, revise it based on what you learn, and then we've had people go out and raise money with it. We've had people like build it and get their first little bit of usage with it. So um, it has a really a range of, of needs depending on the fidelity that you need, and uh, any of them can work. So then on the final day of the design sprint, we want to uh, actually evaluate this with users. Uh, typically, we schedule six of them every hour on the hour. Depending on the size of it, it might be more people. And you always have to plan for 20% uh, of the people not showing up so that you can get the feedback you need or, or improvise. Uh, earlier in the design sprint, you're going to want to plan for who these users were. At the end of the first day, um, you might come in with some of the people scheduled. But if you learn that your users maybe are not exactly who you, you thought they were, uh, once you've actually converged, you might need to reschedule with entirely different users. We just did a, a design sprint, for example, that was for, we do a lot of ed tech, as, these are all education examples, but we had uh, parents and uh, teachers and students. And we realized that the parents weren't a major stakeholder, that this was going to be focusing more on high school students where the parents' approval wasn't quite as important and the parents weren't going to be quite as involved. So we had some sessions with parents. We canceled those. We got a few more kids in and a few more teachers in. And uh, that ended up being the, the thing that we needed to do. So uh, with these uh, 
with these interviews, you uh, get some indication pretty quickly on which things you're validated and which things are invalidated. And you might find that out in the first two. You'll do the next four just to, to really be sure and see if there's nothing that you missed. But it can be really eye-opening that there are times where we had an entire product that we wanted to build. Uh, one example was we were uh, building something that was intended to optimize the power usage at large, uh, at large office buildings like this one. And it was modeled after a consumer company where we had discovered that consumers would change their power consumption not to save money and not to save the environment, but if they thought that their neighbors were doing better than them, they cared about that a lot. And we thought the same thing would be true going in for the corporate clients. And we talked to a few people, it sounded really good. And then we met with the buildings and they immediately were able to see our prototype, interact with that and realize that they didn't want that. They, uh, every building is its own snowflake with its own footprint, its own power usage, its own hours that it needs, its own leases and rules. But we found that uh, what we had built and prototyped to compare your power usage to what you're doing the same day there, or a similar day from your own building in a previous year was really useful. And so that's what went to market and that's what's in, in business today. So uh, that sort of thing can be really powerful. And you know we then had to uh, afterwards uh, present that to the client. And it was very eye-opening for him. He really had to sleep on it. His whole vision that was his father's vision and his father has left him his money to build this and it wasn't what he thought and he slept on it and then afterwards was so glad that he had saved all this time. Like the, this extra functionality was, had caused his budget to triple. And actually once we removed that, uh, after invalidating it, his budget went actually down lower to what his original budget was. So uh, after the, the sprint with this information, we then uh, have some more information that we can communicate to the team if we think that we know what's validated, what's invalidated. If we were to build what was validated, we could get a sense of you know, what some of the technical challenges might be, what the scope of it might be, and uh, we can present all of that in uh, a final presentation and retrospective for the sprint itself. So uh, here's an example of some interviews. Um, some things work, some things will be validated, some things will be invalidated. We can revisit our assumptions to see which are which, and then see what's next. So after a design sprint, we, um, if we're doing things right, I mean, it may be that nothing worked at all. Everything was invalidated, and you're back to the drawing board. You might start another sprint, like you still have the background and the users and what you're trying to do, but you know, to frame a different problem that might be a better opportunity. We did a sprint for Merck, where for an internal tool, where after a two-day sprint, we realized we shouldn't do this. Uh, it may be that everything gets a, a lot of validation. We're really ready to, uh, to start building and refining what we've created. But most often what happens is that some things are validated and some things are not. And for things that aren't uh, validated, we need to you know, go through a similar process and do some additional, sometimes we call them jump starts or design challenges uh, to, uh, to, to revise the things that were invalidated during this time if there was a developer present, and we recommend that sprints have a developer present we would have them work on some things they know they're going to need to do. For example, a, a certain API integration, while the designer goes back and revises the prototype and uh, evaluates it with users again. So then, uh, once that's done, then we're ready to actually break ground on the product and to start building. And we do that, uh, for example, for us, we do a, a XP continuous delivery, you know, weekly iteration process. But during that process, perhaps every two or three months, or even more often, we'd uh, do another design sprint for the next set of functionality based on what we've learned and make sure that we're following similar exercises to evaluate things with users constantly uh, and perhaps create similar prototypes for the features as they're being built to validate them before we create them. So um, just to, to sum everything up, um, Life is too short to build something nobody wants. And uh, if you want to find out more uh, in the book, you can get it from O'Reilly. And it's a, we found it to be a good reference. Like We wrote the book that we would want if we had never done this before, if we wanted to follow this process and 
uh, for each day. It shows what some of the exercises are, has instructions for how to do each of them, has a lot of the, the tooling and things you need around it. It's a really flexible process. You don't have to follow this exact script. You'll, you'll know when other exercises should be swapped in, but we found it to be a, a great way to start new projects to get everyone on the same page. And uh, uh, so I, I can't recommend it enough. And uh, we'll have some time, so please let me know if you have any questions. Anyone? Is this please? presentation yeah. online? Sir? Is this presentation online? Uh, it will be, right? Live presentation. So when, uh, when did you get started with all this stuff? So uh, Google Ventures posts came out about three, three and a half years ago, and uh, ThoughtBot started the process shortly thereafter, about two and a half years ago. I joined two years ago and, uh, and uh, got involved in, in it very actively then, and found as I'd opened off an office for us here in New York, and as we were starting these new projects, uh, I just had been involved. Uh, you know, at like uh, Eric uh, is in, in Lean Startup Machine and in you know, new, early brand new efforts. And I just saw this as you know, something that our, our clients needed. Like they thought they knew what they wanted to build. And like, you know, how do you know you need to build that? What validation have you done? And they said they hadn't. And so this was just a process that I'd gravitated towards and hung out with all, all of our designers as a developer and just got excited about the process and started doing it. Please, uh, in the back, I guess, green. Yeah, um, talk a lot about design, but uh, where do you see the design of a business model fits into this? So often, uh, so we don't do a lot of business model canvassing as part of the design sprint. That's really something that might come before. Like, we know that there's an opportunity that's been identified, and uh, that's, that's almost a, a separate process. This is where uh, this really comes kind of after the strategy, where we know we want to build something in this space. And there, you know, you're thinking about particular problems that you're solving for people. They're paying a certain amount to solve it today, and they might they might do more. And then when you've identified that and decide on the opportunity, then you could schedule a design sprint. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm uh, Dimitri. I'm on the user experience team at Two Sigma. Um, we've done this about ten times in the last two years uh -huh. since the Google thing came out. Um, you mentioned about Merck that. It, Two days is the right number for them. Or, but well, that's what they had, so right. that's what we had to work so with. We, so one thing <laughs> I've found is that right, finding everyone agrees some amount of time should be spent, but agreeing on number is very hard. Oh, the amount, amount of time to spend on the number. I, mean, so, I, I generally am biased to want the number to be bigger. Yeah, uh, I, we've had deep dive sorts of exercises where these have gone over multiple weeks, and it really depends sometimes on the availability of the stakeholders. And again, because of that I, I key effect and because of those decisions, you want them to be there so that they're not going to come and swoop and poop in and, and try to tear everything apart because it doesn't have their darling idea as part of it. So really kind of working around that, and it's a flexible process. And we've shrunk and compressed the timeline. Obviously, more is better, but it might depend on the length of a project. So there have been a couple projects that we did recently. Uh, here, I'll uh, exit out of this. And I had a few of the Trello boards that I brought up. This is one that I've done recently for uh, Automatic, uh, which is a company. They make this little device that you put in uh, under the drivetrain of your car, and it tracks all your data of where you're going. And they wanted to do a data visualization. It had to come out on Black Friday, so we had two weeks to do it. And spending one week on a design sprint just wasn't enough, or what wasn't going to work. So we, uh, we allocated a day to do that. Uh, we had another project where it was someone spending his own money to uh, launch a you know, just a completely concierge site for uh, getting meals cooked by the, the people from the, the countries when you're from, if you're an expat. And so we just wanted to get something that was live and working and accepting money and taking orders and setting up this whole concierge process. And we knew we only had a, about a week to work together. So again, we did the design sprint in a day and compressed the exercises, did expert, did, did excerpts, you know, converged and then did our user research on the real app. So it can vary. Uh, our design team prefers two weeks if we can get it. And often, you know, it's a tough sell to clients and we really have to do the one that Google Ventures recommends. But 
Again, that length of a week, I think, was just so Jake Knapp could fly back and be with his family, which is a very noble goal. But uh, it can expand or contract to the time that you have. So I found that for startups, typically we do the five days. And for enterprises, often we do four, just because uh, we're unable to get enough of the right stakeholders. And so it's because of the stakeholders that we accelerate it to the the two days plus a day of prototype and a day of test. I guess I meant more, do you have negotiating tips? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, it's just really, you wanna make sure that you're building the right thing and validating the right thing and getting a team on the same page because nothing will slow down your effort than you know, not having the opportunity to do that. So, uh, you know, I'm currently in the capacity of a, as our sales director at ThoughtBot, so, you know, I have to, you know, negotiate to try to get this uh, set up. But, you know, talking about it as, as a best practice and a clear process, like if people are coming to you to have your recommendation of how you start this project, and here's the standard way that's worked really well, and, and you should follow the standard process, that, that helps sometimes. We can, uh, we can get a drink sometime, and I'll tell you more stories. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the good news is, like, a lot of it is people just don't know what they're getting. And so being able to say, here's the script and here's what you're going to have and identifying the deliverables is something that we've been able to do. And you know, for us, uh, we're a, a shop that, like, like most shops, we work based on our time. And as such, a design sprint's great because you can cost it out exactly and you know exactly what your deliverables are going to be. That you're going to have this assumptions table, that you're going to have the user journey, that you're going to have a challenge statement that clearly defines the problem that you're trying to solve, and anything that you're uh, that's outside of that is something that might be out of scope. And you deliver all of these things together. Sometimes we've written reports. Typically, we we don't have to, but saying here's what it costs. Here are the deliverables, here are examples of those deliverables, and then showing them the output of previous sprints, which uh, our other clients have been pretty gracious about uh, showing. They're pretty proud of what they came up with, and uh, that, that's helped a lot. Uh, selling the rest of the project and you know, following best practices and talking to users every week, I found to be a tougher sell. Uh, in the back. Sorry, uh, that would be not the very big. Hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about who the developer's role in these conversations and how you can sort of steer the conversation, you know, I think that sometimes when, these, when a developer gets in the room it can be like, no, we can't do this, and I don't know how you can make it a real estate but also a... That's a uh, so the question was, like, what's a developer's role? How can a developer not just come and say, oh, your beautiful vision, it's impossible, we're not going to do it, and uh, just to rain on everybody's parade? And uh, Thanks for that question. It's definitely one after my own heart as, a, as the token developer in this process, and then you know, with co-authoring with two designers as a developer. Uh, we're really you know, there to have a sense of how the technology works, and to guide things, to inform things that are easy and hard. And yes, we can be that sanity check. Uh, there are times uh, during the process, um, there are dot voting exercises where you can dot vote for difficulty and indicate, uh, you know, perhaps with a red dot instead of a green one, some things that are hard. Uh, definitely in the ritual descent is a space that's created for that. When you're presenting the background, uh, you might talk about the existing systems that are in place. These are the APIs that you might be integrating with. This is what they offer and don't offer to, you know, to provide that. And also, um, it's great if you as the developer in this process would then be the developer to continue the implementation afterwards. So it's going to get you on the same page with everyone. You're going to listen to these empathy calls with users and observe the user interviews at the end using the prototype and really getting a sense of what their needs are. And when you're coding in the project later, you'll have a sense of uh, which things are, you know, what their job to be done really is. And is there an easier solution that meets that same problem that doesn't match the design so you can push back on it? Uh, the other thing that's really useful to do in a design sprint as a developer is to, to help scope the work. 
so that uh, after a prototype is created, we'd have a sense of what's easy and hard and what it might take to do the project as a whole afterwards. And that's something that's a really big unknown if you're working in an agile way and you might throw all your ideas away and come up with something else that meets the user's needs. Then the business needs to plan. Maybe there's a marketing push in a certain amount of time that they might need to plan for. There's a budget that needs to be allocated and we can help be realistic about what was created. There's still a lot we don't know, but we can inform it at that time and uh, that, that tends to convince people pretty well. Uh, go ahead. How many times do you have to go through the sprint cycle in order to reach validation? Is it, you know, is there a magic number? Do you go through it two times, three times? So the, the question was, you know, how many times do you have to go through the cycle to get validation? Is there a magic number? The answer is there, there really isn't. Uh, you might never get validation. You might get validation after the first sprint, or it might be validation of assumptions, but there may be more assumptions that you need to validate. Uh, there's just a really large project that we did that was going to be over several months with many moving parts. And we did three sprints for that project uh, in iteration. Often um, we end up doing one, but with these iterations of these extra design challenges so that then the designer would then do a smaller version of the process, uh, review the results with the whole team, but you wouldn't necessarily have to have the whole team in the same room is typically how this thing might go. There'd be iterations to the prototype, those would be reviewed, uh, development would begin on the things that weren't controversial, and that would give a jump start to the, to the project. Um, and maybe two is, is ideal, but it's, uh, you know, to, to your point um, that you were mentioning a moment ago, uh, it's a tough sell to say, hey, we're gonna take an entire week out of, say, a three-month project to just talk about design thinking, and so, it may be a tougher sell to say, hey, we're going to take three weeks to talk about design thinking. So at some point, you want to put a stake in the ground and get something in front of users that they're able to use for real. So the, the right amount might, you know, on most of our projects, tends to be two to three weeks with development starting the second week also. Question. Um, when you say the ideal might be uh, two sprints, mm -hmm. is that a handoff? Or I should say handoff, but do they, like, uh, does one feed into the other? or? They do typically, unless the first sprint gets so much invalidation that you're back to the drawing board. And that has happened. Um, when we've seen that, typically we've just canceled the project and said, hey, we're not going to do this at all, uh, rather than starting something else over. But generally, the, the sprints are such a good way to get a team on the same page. It's useful to continue with the same team. Uh, there have been some projects where, uh, where for example, we've uh, the, the deliverable really was a very comprehensive prototype that was built over three weeks that was then handed off and shopped around for a, a larger project later. So uh, typically, the, these jump starts that we do afterwards would be to, uh, they would be to fix the areas that were invalidated. So if two thirds of it's validated, a third is not, and that leaves a hole in a particular job to be done, we'd focus just on that. And then when we get some validation on that, we'd, we'd do it together and then be able to start the build. Uh, what was your question? So it seems like this methodology requires enough resources, funding, and people. How does this apply to a bootstrap startup? <laughs> well, I mean, with a bootstrap startup, your, you know, your resource is your time. And the good news is, you know, you, you have been getting the background on your space really well. Like, I've never heard of someone doing it on their own, but it'd be a great way to get a bunch of co-founders together. And, you know, you could hire a facilitator uh, to just do it for the week. And there are some bootstrap startups that they can't afford, you know, a three-month project with Thop Up, but they could afford a week of a designer's time to meet with them and their co-founders and to go through this process. So uh, we've had a bunch of individual founders come and do the process, say, with a designer and a developer to build this initial, you know, initial go-to-market uh, prototype with. Uh, you can also, um, the good news about the way that we did this particular book, and Google just announced their book on Amazon today, and I'm really excited about that too, and I can see how th theirs is more oriented around five days. I imagine it's more visionary and less prescriptive uh, and I really recommend reading both. But the good news about uh, our book is 
it, it's a script you can follow. Like you can read it and you know, here we're on this exercise and here are the steps and you can facilitate it with your uh, advisors or co-founders or supporters. If you have a day job, you could, instead of doing this over a course of a week, you could do this you know, nights and weekends for a couple weeks. Uh, so uh, it's really, it, it's a flexible process and it's up to you how you might do it. Do we have more questions? Do you see that this methodology could be used for remote teams? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've done a number of remote sprints. So the sprint that we did for uh, Automatic, for example, uh, the designer, they, they again, they needed to release by Black Friday, and here we were two weeks before. So we, um, the designer who was available, uh, who had the right expertise, was in New York. And so we um, used this Trello board to communicate. And for example, for the, uh, we called them crazy eights instead of eight ups. And his were, I'm not sure which of these were, this might not be his, I'll find them in a second. Um, but you know, for his, he would actually, we printed them out and just put them on the wall and did the same sort of dot voting, took pictures afterwards and sent it to him. There are also uh, tools that you know, facilitate like virtual sticky notes and things like that. So uh, it's definitely a great process to be in the room and to look each other in the eye across the room, but the methodology works remotely and it's been pretty great. All right, um, Trace, that was very solid, thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk. Uh, I've got a bunch of examples by the book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm Trace at ThoughtBot.com if uh, there's ever anything I can do. And I'll be hanging out, so let's chat.